Can anyone explain to me why we spend millions and millions of dollars on educating about drug prevention and don't take drugs because they're bad for you and allowing parents to worry themselves sick about will my child get into drugs because they're mixed in the bad company? They don't have to worry at all. People who are addicted to drugs are addicted to drugs because of their pain. So they're not going to do it because they're in bad company. It's just because they've suffered some trauma. And isn't that an easier thing to solve and heal from? 69.9% of psychiatric inpatients with serious psychotic disorders, well, you've probably guessed it, yes, all of them had suffered from childhood trauma. Bipolar disorder was mentioned. 82 to 86% of people with bipolar disorder have suffered from some form of childhood trauma. Border personality disorder, 90% have suffered. Then let's talk about the one that we've been millions, $79 million last year spent on raising awareness of, depression. How many people who suffer from de depression do you think have suffered from childhood trauma or abuse? 80% research tells us. And how many of you here have heard one word about what's happened in your childhood and that might help you to heal from your depression or anxiety? So what are we doing? Raising awareness so that we can feed the pharmaceutical companies, so that people can take more medication? I work with survivors of childhood trauma. And I know from our independent research that four years after just a five-day program, there is a highly statistically significant, I can never say that word, highly statistically significant reduction in depression. Six months after a five-day program, a 45% reduction in measured serious mental illness. So what's, what's the silence? Why don't, why don't we talk about this? Why are we not allowed to acknowledge childhood trauma? Why are we not encouraged to heal from childhood trauma when we know because of neuroplasticity that this is possible? And I'm talking about suicide how agonizing it is. The young women I work with at Heal for Life, I have one common complaint when they go to hospital having tried to kill themselves. Nobody ever asks why. And if they did, they would get the same answer from all those young people. Because of my internal pain from my childhood, because I think I'm worthless and worth nothing, because no one cares about the fact that I've been abused. And if I look at um, Esperance, which in the Central Coast runs a wonderful suicide prevention service, Tony Humphrey wrote to me and said, 90%, around 90% of all the women who have attempted suicide, who I have worked with, have either suffered from sexual abuse or child abuse of some type, and a slightly lower percentage for the men. So have any of you ever seen anything about suicide prevention, which has talked about what happened in your childhood, has there been a campaign which has said, ask a friend when they're down, what happened in your childhood? Talk to me about your childhood. Because that is very, very likely to have an impact on your current mental well-being. So maybe for a moment, you, some of you may be thinking, well, what, she keeps talking about childhood trauma and abuse. What actually is it? Childhood trauma covers a huge spectrum. It covers abandonment, death of a parent, alcoholic parents, childhood sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse. Um, it covers, of course, natural, natural disasters. What happens when trauma occurs, trauma is more emotion than the brain can deal with. Trauma, at the time it is happening, the person, in an age-appropriate way, thinks that their life is threatened. And the brain uh, reacts to this trauma and develops differently, which is why childhood trauma has a much bigger impact on behaviour later and, and the whole way the brain operates later in life. Trauma cannot be remembered because what is creating this silence? Is it embarrassment? Is it shame? Are we shamed by the stigma because we're not allowed to know when there's a rape victim the name of the rape victim, as if in some way that rape was their fault? But every single one of you here can help change that. If each one of you help me in my big idea, if each one of you who has actually suffered from childhood trauma says, I have no reason to be ashamed of it, it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault that my childhood was not perfect, and I deserve love and support. 
If those of you, when you meet someone who's addicted from gambling, alcohol, drugs, if you say to them, hey, has anyone ever discussed with you what happened in your childhood? Do you think you might like to heal from your childhood? If only with anyone with a mental illness you could say to them, not just, which is a wonderful campaign, but are you okay, but hey, do you want to talk about what happened in your childhood? Because I understand an awful lot of people with mental illness have suffered from some form of childhood trauma. Talk to me about it. Every single one of you could do that. Every single one of you can help me achieve my big idea. Every single one of you can get involved and help us to make this world a happy place. All the substances of abuse, whether they're opiates or cocaine or anything else, they're actually painkillers. Some of them specifically are painkillers. But physical pain and emotional pain, the suffering is experienced in the same part of the brain. So when people suffer emotional rejection, the same part of the brain will light up as if you stuck them with a knife. The Neckhart Tolle says very nicely uh, that addictions begin with pain and end with pain. So that all the addictions are attempts to soothe the pain. So when I work with addictions, the first question is always not why the addiction, but why the pain. And uh, what you find is emotional loss or trauma. In the case of the severe addicts, as in the downtown east side here, there were every single one of them traumatized. There's no women walking in the streets here who had not been sexually abused, not even by accident. But, but, but you know, whether it's a sex addiction or internet or, or, or um, relationship or shopping or work addiction, these are all attempts to get away from distress. Keith Richards, the Rolling Stone guitarist, said, uh, who used to have a severe heroin habit, as you know, he said that all the contortions we go through just not to be ourselves for a few hours. Well, why would somebody not want to be themselves? Because they're in too much distress, in too much pain. So I don't care what they tell you about genetics or any of that choices or any of that nonsense. It's always about pain. Well, the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, uh, it's got a wonderful line in it. Whatever you do, don't try and escape from your pain. But be with it. Because the, the, the attempt to escape from pain is what creates more pain. And that's the reality with addiction. But the question is, how can people with their pain? Well, only if they sense some compassion from somebody. So as another teacher says, only when compassion is present will people allow themselves to see the truth. So addicted people need a, a compassionate present which will permit them to experience their pain without having to run away from it. And all the attempts to run away, it's like another teacher says, the surest way to go to hell is to try to run away from hell. So you've got to be with that pain. You just have to be with it, but you have to have some support. And, and we live in a society that, one way or the other, is always about instant relief, quick satisfaction, distraction. In other words, we live in a culture that is based on, both economically and, and psychologically, on not uh, supporting people to be with themselves. So it's always the quick getaway. So it's very difficult to deal with addictions in a society. But yeah, it is a matter of, at some point, finding a way of being with your pain so that you can actually get to know what it's really all about. Let me tell you where we've been in the public health. This model is borrowed from camera Phyllis Jones. This is a cliff. This is a child walking towards the edge of the cliff. The child falls off and hits the bottom. That child is broken. And when that child is broken, what we hope is that there are ambulances ready to pick him up and that there's air in the tires, and that they can then go to a hospital filled with decent doctors and decent nurses. That's what we're hoping for. This is called tertiary care. Children's Hospital of Philadelphia is the tertiary care hospital probably in the world. Certainly one of the very few. We are magnificent 
at picking up broken children. But then some people said, that's crazy. Why would you let people hit the bottom? So what they did is they built trampolines halfway down under the hope that the kids would bounce and bounce and bounce and bounce. But what happens is some kids bounce off, and in times of social stresses or economic um, stress, then that trampoline gets holes in it and kids fall through. That is called secondary prevention. This is what drug treatment is. This is what um, uh, Covenant House is, what I do there. Kids who have fallen off the cliff and we're trying to prevent them from hitting the bottom. And then some people said, that's crazy. Why would you let kids fall off the cliff in the first place? So what they did is they built a fence. They filled, built a fence at the edge of the cliff so that kids wouldn't fall off. The problem is that the kids keep coming, they keep coming, they keep coming, and in time, some kids fall off. And in times of economic stresses or social duress, then that fence gets holes in it and kids fall through. That is called primary prevention. Primary prevention is when you build a fence at the edge of the cliff to prevent people from falling through. But where do you build the fence? And whom do you keep in? So now you do large epidemiologic studies to figure out who's likely to fall off. And we have the answer. It's black people. It's brown people. It's indigenous nations. It's gay people. It's poor people. And we understand that that is the population that falls off the cliff. And now you have racism and classism in social policy. And more important, you have unconscious biases that we all bring to the table about individuals from a group known to have bigger problems. Then what happened is some people said, that's crazy. Why would you let people fall to the edge of the cliff in the first place or get to the edge of the cliff? And then they said, let's look at the social determinants that make it more likely for you to hit the edge of the cliff. And this was about 15, 17 years ago. And this was great because this is undoubtedly about race because of racism. This is undoubtedly about being gay because of homophobia. This is undoubtedly about being poor because of unequal distribution of resources. And it changes everything. And where we are now, like we have never been in the history of humanity, is we understand that the social determinant that ties all of this stuff together more than anything is childhood trauma. How did we begin learning this? This is the first study, sponsored by the CDC, published in 1988, and 98, excuse me, and um, by Felidi and Anda, and um, it worked with 18,000 people in San Diego County. We so want kids to choose healthy behaviors, the kind of behaviors that are going to make kids thrive far into the future. Let's look at behavioral change. It's pretty well studied. What we know is that there are five-ish steps to behavioral change. The first thing that we need to do is we need to make it so the kids are aware of a problem. That's why we teach them. But if you just make kids aware, that's not gonna get them really too far because they have to be personally motivated. If you're aware that something's happening to other people, you're still not gonna take any action because you don't know that it affects you. So we have to have kids understand that this problem can affect them. But then we have to take it another step because what we normally do with education is we say, this is what'll happen to you and this is what you better do. But we don't give them the skills of what to do, right? So if I tell you that in order to be safe, you need to use protection, but you don't know how to deal with a partner who looks at you and who says, what, you don't trust me? Is that why you want me to use this? If you don't know how to deal with that, you're not gonna be able to listen to what I'm suggesting. So when we make people aware and we make people motivated, but we don't give them skills, we actually do more harm than good. Why? Because we produce kids who are frustrated, motivated, but frustrated. Frustration leads to stress. Stress drives all negative behavior. You've done more harm than good. So we give them skills. And then what happens? Kids are gonna go through a process of weighing the costs and benefits. What's good about what I'm doing? What's bad about what I'm doing? Uh, what's better about this new behavior? What's worse about this new behavior? You know, I'm 16 years old and I'm thinking of quitting smoking cigarettes and I'm saving $8 a day and my teeth aren't yellow and when she kisses me, um, she doesn't go, ooh, and that's all good, but gosh, I'm nervous. 
that kid's not ready to quit. Why? Because until we teach him how to uh, calm his nerves, it's never going to feel better to quit. Finally, the final thing is, am I going to maintain the new behavior or am I going to give up on the new behavior? Am I going to relapse? That's about how people reinforce or undermine my behavior. I choose not to have sex. What's going to happen when I turn on the TV and I see someone like me who's choosing not to have sex? Do they look like one of the popular kids? What's going to happen when I talk to my friends about my choice? Are they going to say to you, Ken, you know, you have a really strong spiritual center? Or are they going to go, what's wrong with you? It's all about how people are responded to once they've chosen their behavior. So again, all behavioral change theories in a blender. Here's what they say. Are you aware? Are you motivated? Do you have the skills? Are you prepared to move forward even when you weigh the costs and benefits? And once you're there, are people going to undermine or support your behavior? But you know what? All the behavioral change theories are missing something huge. What they're missing is that some kids are incredibly demoralized. Some kids aren't ready to get on the playing field. Some kids can hear, but they can't listen. Why? Because they've absorbed a message from too many people that says that they're incapable for one reason or another, what they look like, who they are, how much money they have for one reason or another. They don't believe they're capable of change. I believe that the key thing to do when you're working with a young person who's demoralized, who's oppressed, perhaps who's depressed, but who's marginalized for one reason or another, is to love them. Because love breaks demoralization. What does love mean? You know, we speak English, and so love sounds like it could be a dirty thing. And because of that, I don't use the word with kids. But if we were speaking any one of a number of other language, we would be talking about loving kindness, the love of humanity. And that's what I'm talking about. What I do when I sit with a kid is I let myself fall in love. What blows me away about that kid? Resilience in the context of a, of a, of a life that would have destroyed me. Um, compassion in a young person who has shown none. Um, someone who has uh, grew up and saw his, his uh, mother beaten by his father, but who wants to grow up to uh, protect battered women. You listen to those stories. You say very little, but you hear them. And when you hear them, you reflect it back to the kid. And suddenly, they begin to open up. You've taken shame and stigma away from the room, and instead, you've added hope. Not hope that I've showered on you, not hope that I have falsely put on you, but hope that existed within you based on who you are, who you really are, how you've survived, how you've risen, based on who you are. That's what I call love. Eliciting the stories, hearing kids like they've never been heard before, and telling them their stories back in a way that they've never heard before. Let me tell you something. If you talk to people who are 25 or 26 and they've turned their lives around and you know they were like living the life when they're 18, 19, 20, 14, 15, 16, and you ask them what it was that made a difference, it's always the same answer. It was when Miss Cordella, Mr. Steve, Mr. Hugh, um, Miss Lucretia, it's when they made me understand that I wasn't trash. That is the pivotal moment of change in a young person's life. And that is what every one of us can do. It doesn't take training. It takes your heart and your ears.